Testing, one, two, 63, 63. He's on line. Are we close? Are we close? We got, are we live yet? It said we had two more minutes. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Everybody got a handout? Okay, good evening online. If you want the scripture for tonight, ha, we, uh, Miss Wendy will email it to you. Just send her a text with your email address. Uh, we do have a handout with scripture on it. Or, as one person said, you could just put the Bible. That's where it's at in there, right? So, we are on Revelation chapter 12, Revelation chapter 12. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let me turn my phone down. Hang on. There we go. Uh, we're testing as of, if you know, Sunday, uh, the video was glitchy Sunday. We, it wasn't in the building, but it was online. So we are working to solve that. Uh, we're getting there. But uh, thank you so much for coming tonight. We appreciate you being here. Uh, Brother Nichols, will you bless tonight? Amen, amen. Uh, tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, online only, is Sunday School with Diane Scott. She's going to be doing our Sunday School class this week, so tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. And then Friday night is Mark Scott online with RRM Ministries. Uh, but tonight, Revelation chapter 12. Uh, there's 17 verses to Revelation chapter 12, so what we're going to do is, and it's not the way I normally do things, as you know, but we're going to do outline. So we're not going to break it down verse by verse, word by word. So it, it's a little different, but we want to be able to finish this at some point, uh, <laughs> some point before the year ends, hopefully. But uh, Revelation chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. If you're there, say amen. amen. Anybody online saying amen? Ha. Uh, we're going to read the first six verses. Ha. I got a ha from the peanut gallery. Very good. So if you have a question tonight, you'll walk up to the mic and ask the question. That way people online can hear the question. Verse 1, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she began, and she being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon it was, as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand and two hundred and three score days, twelve hundred and sixty days. So to do an overview of these first six verses, first of all, it says there was a great sign, sign in heaven, a great sign, sign in heaven. It's going to be a long night. A great sign in the heavens. Now, what does that mean? Uh, it literally means great is megos in the Greek. Uh, sign means that it is something that we need to look at, but not necessarily in a literal, uh, literally on the earth type situation. A sign means it's a sign of something, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it literally is something. So who is the woman? Does anybody know who the woman is? Israel, very good. Uh, it pretty much plays out throughout Scripture uh, that this is Israel. This is the first sign of seven signs that John will mention to us. Uh, it's a, a great sign, he says. And the woman, and as you guessed, some of you guessed, the woman is Israel. 
So it's an image of Israel. So right now what we need to look at and understand is this. Uh, as John is sharing this with us, he's kind of going back and starting over again. So he's giving you a highlight. And if you tell stories, you do the same thing. You give a highlight, then you break it down. And that's kind of the way this is happening. So he says there is a woman, and the woman is Israel. And we'll break it down just a little bit more. Um, how many know that women in Scripture are often related to religious systems or to countries or those type things, right? So in your notes, it probably says, I don't have the ones in front of me, but it probably says something like uh, that Jezebel in Revelation 2.20 relates to a religious system of false teachings. Uh, the great harlot in Revelation 17.20 is related to a woman, of course. And then the bride of Christ in Revelation 19, seven, verses 7 and 8. And actually, if you go back through the Psalms, oftentimes he calls it a woman. A woman is, is related to things in Scripture. So if we see this woman, then we can literally say that it relates to something. Uh, and I'm not going to beat down any other religion. I'm, I'm, I, I believe there's too much negative right now in the world, and we need positive. Uh, but there are religions that believe that this woman is Mary. Have you ever heard of that? That the woman is Mary. There's a couple of religions out there that believe that this is Mary uh, and that the son, of course, is Jesus. Uh, but we won't get into which religions those are. Uh, I believe, without speculation, that Israel plays out right here throughout Scripture that this is Israel. The sign is Israel. All right, anybody with a comment there? Everybody's quiet. Uh, Genesis 37, 9 through 11, Jacob has a dream. And the sun represents Jacob. The moon represents Joseph, Joseph's mother, Rachel. And the 11 stars were the sons of Israel, which bowed down to Joseph. Joseph is also a representation of Christ in the Old Testament, an image, a mirror, or a stereotype, or a type, if you will, a type and shadow. So literally, if you go back to Jacob's dream in Genesis, now remember that when we're looking at Revelation, we can find most of it in Genesis. We can find most of what we're going through back and forth between the two books, the beginning and the end, the Alpha, the Omega, uh, the first and the last. So Jacob is literally telling this dream, and his dad is like, are we going to bow down to you? So when you put him in with the 11 stars, what you see is the 12 tribes of Israel. So it paints the picture again to the Jewish people, but to all of us, that the woman that John sees, the very first great sign is a picture of Israel. Now, why is that important to us tonight? Well, I'll share with you. How about that? Um, if you're anywhere in this world today and you're watching what is being said, everyone relates every end time prophecy to the United States of America. That's because we are programmed in the United States of America. We don't like that word. We don't like to hear that we're programmed. We don't like to see that. But at the end of the day, we think in a Western culture mindset. So if he is showing us a picture of the major players in the end time tribulation, the first great sign is Israel. So how many know what's going on in Israel right now in the last two days? How many know what's going on in America? We all do, right? Because all of our news, all of our social media, everything revolves around what's going on here. But did you know in Israel that they are coming against the president, uh, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, and they are calling for his resignation, they are protesting in the streets, and he is a friend to the Hebrew people. We want him to stay in power because he is not liberal in any way. He is conservative, Hebrew. He's going to fight for the Jews. In fact, he will fight for the Jews. And yet they're calling for his resignation for someone that is more uh, futuristic mindset. 
And so when we think about end times, remember that the first great sign in Revelation 12 was the United States of America, right? Israel. Israel is the first great sign. So if you really want to know what's going on biblically, don't necessarily look to your local newspaper. While it does relate to us, this is not the players of the end time. We, we will be involved as a nation, but we're not the big players in the end time. Everybody understand that so far? You got that? Do you like that, knowing that we're not going to be the big player that we are right now? Kind of scary, isn't it? Thinking that America right now is the superpower. But in the tribulation, we're not going to be the superpower anymore. Other scripture that relates to that besides Jacob's dream is Isaiah 54, 1 through 6, Jeremiah 3, 20, Ezekiel 16, 8 through 14, Hosea chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. Uh, there's so much we could say here, but symbolically we believe that this is Israel. Verse 2, being with child, she cried out in labor in pain to give birth. So we know that Israel is God's chosen people and that we are grafted in. Praise God for that. But Israel gave birth to a child. Who is that child? Jesus. Very good, very good. That child is Jesus. So now if we're looking at this, when he's been giving us a breakdown, day-by-day day sort of breakdown of the Old Testament or of the way it works, now all of a sudden he's giving you an overview again of, okay, Israel started it and they're going to birth a child 4,000 years later. And there's going to be pain when that child is born. Uh, can, you, can you remember what was happening when Jesus was born? Romans were in control of Israel. They were actually being occupied by the Romans. They were under Roman rule. Israel was not its own nation. They were literally uh, held captive, if you will, prisoners to Rome. When Jesus was born, Herod wanted all the male children killed. We'll get into that a little bit more in a few minutes. But if you think, so here it is. He's telling about it. And the way I see it is this. If he's showing them this again, he wants them to see that Jesus is the Messiah and that this is what's going on. Um, I'm, I'm trying to break it down so maybe you'll understand it uh, a little bit more because there is some complication in it. Uh, have you ever noticed that sometimes we humans see the negative side instead of the positive side we t our, our flesh tends to see a glass half empty rather than half full uh, an example of that would be this uh how many has heard in the last days there will be peerless times how many's heard that recently over and over and over and over the words in the last days perilous times shall come but do you know what else that the bible says in the last days I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. But right now in America, we're meditating more on the peerless times than we are the fact that while there's peerless times, he's going to be pouring out his spirit. So rather than to meditate on and walk in the anointing of the spirit of God, we end up wallowing in the, what's going to be the negative. So he's trying to get them to see that Messiah is Christ. He wants them to look beyond what they're seeing to be able to see this. Uh, Israel was under Roman rule. Verse 3, the dragon, behold a fiery dragon, seven heads and ten horns, seven diadems on his head, uh, dracon. So we know that two of the key players, let me back up, Israel and Jesus. Those are two of your key players in the tribulation time. Number three is dracon, or a great fiery dragon. Dracon in the Greek means a dragon or, and this is actually, actually the definition of the word, a name for Satan. So who's going to be a key player in the last times? Satan. 
Israel, Jesus, and Satan. That's what he starts chapter 12 with as an overview. Now we know in chapter 11 that he said that three and a half years in that the wrath of God would be poured out. It would no longer be about uh, the Antichrist's wrath, but it would be the wrath of God. And in essence, at the end of that chapter, he said that it's settled, it's done, and all of heaven could rejoice because they knew that it, the, that it was playing out and there was no change in it. So now he's going back and giving them an overview of how this begins the three and a half years with the dragon. He wants them to know, okay, Israel, you had the Messiah, and then Satan's going to attack. Okay? Still with me? Y'all are like way too quiet tonight. That's okay, though. We'll be done in 10 minutes. How about that? Uh, the uh, commentator Johnson says it suggests power and his murderous nature, a picture full of evil when he describes the dragon that we read about, uh, it, that he's hideous, but he's full of strength and power. Uh, one of the things that I think we need to look at, and we'll touch on it a little bit later, but um, Satan believes he is the same as God. And to be honest with you, in the world we live in, a lot of people put him on the level with God. Satan is an angel. He is on the level with Michael and the archangels. He is not on the level with God. There is no one. God the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are here. So when the enemy comes with full force, he's still a level below. Remember that. Remember, the God that lives in you is greater than the enemy that comes against you, although he wants you to believe that he's on the same level with God. Why did he do what he did? We'll move on. Seven diadems on his head, literally proclaiming royalty or his thought of being king or royal. Also found in Revelation 13, 1. That's in your notes, should be. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horn ten crowns, and upon his head the name of blasphemy. Daniel 7, 7 and 8. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it was ten horns. And I considered the horns and behold that there came up among them another little horn. Before whom there were three of the first horns plucked by the roots. And behold in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man. And the mouth speaking great things. This is Daniel describing this beast thousands of years before, this, before John sees it. So most believe, and I'm not going to get into this deep. Uh, how many have heard in your life, if you've ever studied Revelation at all, that this is the revised Roman Empire? Y'all heard that? So has anybody ever actually studied Revelation before? Uh, okay. It's the revised Roman Empire most believe. The European Union. How many heard that? Oh, this is the European Union. Daniel's prophecy. This is the European Union. That they're going to they're gonna have the euro and it's going to take over the world. And, and all of that is speculation. And if you studied Revelation 25 years ago like I did for the first time in depth, what you saw then and what you see now doesn't look the same. Because the world is ever changing. So for me to put exactly what nations this will be or what nations will be led by, the, by Satan, I can't give you that. I can give you speculation, but that's all. I can tell you that Scripture plays out. Israel is involved, Jesus is involved, and Satan is involved. And you can believe if it's the revised Roman Empire, cool. If you believe it's something different, that's okay too. I'm believing I'm not going to be here for it. So, <laughs> um, but when you look at this, originally ten kingdoms, now seven, and everybody's looking for that. But can I just say this without offending? Um, 
And I really don't want to offend anyone. But if somebody is dogmatic about this is how it has to be, uh, chances are, chances are as the world plays out, we're not only going to get a black eye for saying dogmatic about how it had to be this, this nation or that that isn't clearly marked out, but we make God look bad. When we speculate and then we attach to it, we end up with things like the Da Vinci Code and, and, and all this stuff out there, and we give God a bad name. And I never want to offend him. I never want to make the world look at him because of me in a, in a bad light. Does that make sense? So we want to make sure that what we say is, look, we know that, that Israel's going to be involved. We know Satan's going to be involved. We know Jesus is going to be involved. But other than that, we know that there are going to be nations plugged in, led by the Antichrist, but we can't confirm. You know, because if we're really going to think about it, Iraq is still, or Iran is still a player out there. Uh, Russia is still a player out there. China is still a player out there. And you never know who will rise. When, when Russia fell, we thought, Man, that one's, but, but now Russia is rising rapidly to power again. And so we, we need to be cautious in speculating what we're seeing. So let's review this real quick. There's a great sign. The sign is that Israel, Jesus, and Satan are going to be a part of this. They're going to be key players. Israel, Jesus, and Satan. Verse 4. And the dragon's tail drew a third of the stars out of heaven. Uh, what does that relate to? What? A third of the angels. We, we pretty much, through Scripture, can confirm that a third of the angels went with him. He was created in power, just like Michael and the other archangels. And then he, he had will, free choice, like us. Let me know that God doesn't send anybody to hell. Everybody says, well, why would God send someone to hell? He's never sent anyone to hell, ever. Not once ever in the history of the world. People choose to not follow, and they condemn themselves. So Satan chose, to the best of our knowledge, to rise up and try to defeat God. And he took a third of the angels with him, or at least that's the way we break it down. Uh, it says that the... Uh, a third of the angels described in verse 9 of this chapter, the angels were not created evil. They chose, just like God never sends people to hell. They chose. He came to devour her son as soon as it was born. Again, this is a picture of Satan trying to use Herod to destroy Jesus. And even in the end, 33 years later, Satan thought, or at least I assume he thought, that he had defeated Christ and he put him on a cross and, and he took him out or so he thought this relates Herod relates to trying to kill the baby Jesus in Matthew 2 16 through 18 John 8 58 and Mark 4 35 through 41 I shouldn't give you a handout because that makes it too easy you should have to look these up yourself you know it um uh, Verse 5 tells us that Jesus was born to rule the world. That's pretty plain and simple, cut and dried. So, I mean, that, that, if you want to know where that's found, start in Genesis and go to Revelation. That's where you'll find it. Uh, in the 66 books of the Bible. Psalms 2 tells us that. Revelation 19, 15, if you need other verses, tells us that. Verse 6, the woman fled to the wilderness for 1,260 days or three and a half years. Now, this is where it begins to be where we're at in time, the middle of the tribulation. At least that's where we're studying to. Does anybody know where, she, where Israel goes and hides? Do you know the city? You do. That's not fair. You don't, you don't get to say. Anybody know the city? You would love this. I'm not going to go into details, but you would love this. It's the city of Petra. The city of Petra. And the reason he would love it is he loves 
geography and all those things. And so I'm going to give you a nugget, and then you go dig in it if you choose. The city of Petra is based in a mountainside inside of Jordan. If you go back through the history of Jordan and Israel, they're not friends, but Jordan has always known not to really fight with Israel. So they kind of comply. Anyway, it's a real neat study to study that, but when they go into Petra, that's the area that God is going to protect the 144,000 Jews and the great multitude, which no man can number. He's going to go there and protect them supernaturally. Because Satan is going to come full force against them. We'll get into that in just a minute. That can also be found in Daniel 9, Daniel's 70th week. Uh, it actually says so uh, in Scripture. Yeah, it actually, Scripture actually says it. Uh, and I'll find that verse for you if you'd like. Uh, I don't have it in front of me, but I may have it in front of me shortly, but uh, I don't remember, to be honest. Uh, but it shows a gap between verse 5 and 6, uh, typical with prophecy. If you study Genesis any, one of the theories of the book of Genesis is, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form or void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Pause, and then jump into that, some believe that Satan was cast down, the earth was dormant. It laid here for many, many, many thousands and thousands of years. You can believe that or not. Uh, but, but then God began to create the earth for inhabitation by us. And Satan had already been put here for a season anyway. Uh, neither here nor there. So much that you could dig into here that just little rabbit trails you can chase. Uh, so we see it showing overviews and then breaking it down. The woman is Israel and God will supernaturally protect them. The place is called the city of Petra, south of the Dead Sea. If you ever take time, study it. You would enjoy it. Uh, you would really enjoy the study of Petra. It's pretty neat. Uh, tonight we won't go there. Side note. John used the same words. I actually have side note written in. Side note. John used the same words in chapter 14, verses 2 and 3 of Jesus going to prepare a place. Showing us that it was orchestrated by God. So when John is writing the gospel of John, he is writing using the exact same words as God's going to take them and prepare them and protect them as he did when he says, I go to prepare a place for you. Just a nugget. Let's move on. Any questions up to this point? Anybody online asking questions? Uh, all right verse 7 and 8 and there was war in heaven Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not neither was their place found anymore in heaven pretty much self-explanatory they fought with Michael not Jesus some people believe that Michael and Jesus that is not what it says it says they fought with the archangel Michael and the boys and they lost, and they no longer had a place in heaven. Uh, the timeline of this is interesting to me, at least trying to figure out when and where it happened. Uh, let me give you a couple of scripture. Daniel 12, 1, and at, the same, and at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book of life. So let me throw this out, uh, and I'll give you a couple of notes for it. How many believes Satan has right now access to heaven? Satan has access to heaven right now. Now, if you want to go back and study this, you might find that Satan did not, he was cast out once before, and then he tricked Adam and Eve because, and then became accessible back. Christ stopped that, but he still had access to accuse the brethren. So we, we find that in several scripture, Job 1, 6 through 12, and Revelation 12, 10, which we haven't gotten to yet, but he literally Satan right now has the authority to accuse the brethren. 
One of the reasons that there is so much rejoicing about the beginning of the, th the last three and a half years or the great tribulation is Satan is no longer going to have authority to accuse anybody of anything. He's not going to have access to the throne room of God anymore, my belief. Um, possible note here, how is the battle fought? We know it's a real fight, but is it material or spiritual? The battle with Satan and his demons is spiritual, fought on the battleground uh, of truth and deception or of fear and faith, Ephesians 6, 12. In regard to material attacks against the believer, Satan and his demons were disarmed at the cross, Colossians 2, 15. Among angels, it is possible that there is a material battle to be fought in a way we can only imagine. Um, so you have to look at it kind of both ways. Um, and I'm going to say this, and, and I, again, I probably shouldn't. But if you're studying this with commentaries and breaking it down, here's what you're going to find. Every single commentator has an idea and a thought. But a lot of them spend more time telling you why someone else is wrong than they do telling you why they're right. So I've prayed about this and I've, I've come to a conclusion we're not going to beat down anybody else. You and I both know that, that, that there's religions out there that, that see it differently than us. And we have to understand that if we spend all of our time trying to discredit someone else, we're not doing justice to God by crediting Him. So, there's my note, my nugget, we'll move on. Uh, that's my two cents worth anyway. Satan has always wanted authority over God, and we would use any means to get it, even within us, if we're not cautious. Easy prey, right? God has no equal. Satan has power and authority like the angels, but not like God, period. Verse 9, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. Now we prove that that dragon is Satan, right? Which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. On your page, it should say the scripture, falls of Satan mentioned in the Bible, Ezekiel 28, 14 through 16, Job 1, 12, 1 Kings 22, 21, Zechariah 3, 1, Revelation 12, Revelation 20, and Luke 10, 18. And we won't be able to break all that down tonight, but, but when God's wrath begins to be poured out, if Satan is cast out and he no longer has a place in heaven whatsoever then this might be the moment in time that the Antichrist is killed. We'll get into that later in the next few chapters. But where the Antichrist is killed and he comes back and Satan enters him. So imagine Satan, if he's mad now, what's going to happen when he's had access to the whole earth, moving as a, a, an angelic spiritual being, if he is contained? And he knows his time is about up. 1,260 days left and he knows it. How much wrath is he going to try to present or to pour out? And he knows he can't destroy God, so what's the next best thing? Go after God's children, right? That's what he wants to do. And so at this point when it says that, that they was cast out, I believe he was cast to earth and God said, you're done. You're not, you don't get access here anymore. And this will be in the midpoint of the tribulation. I gave you the scripture, right? Any comments there? Okay. How many is confused? It's very confusing. You can't just go through it once, and we really are blowing through it. But if not, we could take five years breaking it down to help you understand, and you'd probably still be confused because I'm still confused. But we're getting the highlights of it. Verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, for the accusers of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. 
Let me read you that one again. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation. It doesn't tell us who the voice is, but now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren, which might lend to saying that it's uh, the 24 elders, that, it was, that it's human beings' voice that's coming out because he says, our brethren, which is not angelic beings but human beings, is cast down which accuse them before our God day and night. And then verse 11 in context, we've read this verse 8 million times in our life, but now in context, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. They overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Verse 12, Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth, and the seal and of the seal of the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he has known that he hath but a short time. Some things we've already talked about, but the accuser of the brethren is now cast out. He's been beat by Michael and the boys and the, the other angels. Him and his have been cast out to the earth. This has happened before, we know, but now... He's being cast out in the middle of the tribulation period. So here he is on earth, and he's mad. He knows his time's about up. He's read the book too, right? He knows the end product of this. But catch some things that are said here. It says, we're covered by the blood, and we have the testimony of what he has done for us. Somebody ought to shout glory right there. Shout it again. Why do I ask you to rejoice? Let me read verse 12 again. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Where did he say to rejoice? The heavens and those that are in them or that dwell there. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the seal for the devil is come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that his time is is but a short time. This is another one of those nuggets that talk about to, to me that all that are going to be saved other than the Jewish people and the ones that have fled to Petra, the inhabitants of the earth are the ones left. So he says rejoice to those that are in the heavens and that dwell there. So it would lead you at least speculate as another point for the rapture before the tribulation. I know not everybody believes that, and that's cool. We don't have to. But here he says, at the midpoint of the tribulation, that all the inhabitants of the earth are about to have the wrath of Satan poured out on them. So rejoice, those of you that have already made it to heaven. Rejoice, those that have already made it here, because the wrath is going to be poured out. And, and it's, again... If you go back and read verse 11, uh, he talks about, and they overcame. Overcame is a past tense word by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Uh, and they love not their lives to death. So it literally relates to a past tense form, if you will. So it, it does relate, the scripture at least opens another avenue of believing in a pre-trib rapture. No, nope. yes. amen. <laughs> yeah, we want that, don't we? We don't want to stay through this junk. COVID's bad enough. We don't want to be here, but, but here's reality. And I talked about it Sunday morning a little bit. Um, you need to be prepared if you have to stay. You need to know that you know that you know that you're going to die for your faith no matter what. Well, that'll never happen in America. <laughs> Never thought we'd all be sitting in church wearing masks either, did you? Uh, reality. Make sure that you know that you know that you know that you would die for your faith no matter what. Because if it comes to that, if we're still here, 
You want to be on the side of God. And I, I can't emphasize, one of the studies of Revelation ought to scare us to the point, because it's the Revelation and we're blessed to know it, but we ought to know that we don't want to be without God during this time. Amen? You don't want to be without God. Actually, I, I couldn't fathom being without Him right now. Uh, as, as wretched as I am as a human being some days, uh, most days, whatever you want to call it, I am so thankful that I can lay down at night and say, Father, forgive me. Forgive me if I have offended you in any way. Because nothing that I do do I want to offend you. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Make me whole. You say, well, you don't have to get saved over and over. No, but you need to repent for your sins. And I recommend that at least once a day. Uh, for me and Bigfoot, about six times a day, right? He's back there going, amen. But moving on. I could preach right there, but we won't. Verse 13. And when the dragon saw that he was cast under the earth, he persecuted the woman. Who's he persecuting? Israel. Israel. We, and we are attached to that because we're grafted in, which brought forth the man-child. And the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. This is talking about Israel being protected. Um, and we'll get into it a little bit more. Let me read verse 15. And the serpent cast out his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. And the earth helped the woman. And the earth opened up her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. So Satan's attack on Israel is so real. The two witnesses have been killed. The wrath of God is getting ready to be poured out. And this is so real, the attack that he has against Israel because she birthed the Christ that literally is going to destroy him. And he is so mad that he is doing everything he can. If this is literal, he literally pours a flood. We know the world will never be destroyed by a flood again. But it, but it says that the earth opens up and swallows up the water. God is going to supernaturally, and we'll see more of this in the next few chapters, God is going to supernaturally protect Israel. I think we miss this. As grafted into Israel, we need to be walking in the promises of God, not the negatives of the world. We need to stop talking about the times that we're in and start talking about the God of the times. And we need to learn to walk in the Holy Spirit of God. If he allows me, I hope so because I've already got part of my notes finished for Sunday. I want to talk about the power of the Holy Ghost to the believers. Because church, I believe that we're fighting battles we shouldn't be fighting in the first place. We're fighting struggles that were not ours to fight. And the Holy Spirit is supposed to give us the power and the anointing and the authority to get past that. And, and literally the power... And we're going to have to choose to walk in those days rather than the days of the peerless times. Anyway, I'll move on. He wants to hinder God. He will do everything he can against God's people. Brings into question, will there be any, anyone here in other areas serving God at all? Or will it be strictly those Jews and others hiding in the mountain? Still relating to the last three and a half years of the tribulation. Uh, he spews out against Israel, whether that's literal flood or a uh, financial whatever type flood that would destroy or crush. Uh, if it's symbolic, it could be financial, military, or anything else. Uh, watch what's going on in Israel, guys, and I'll give you another one. Pray for the peace of Israel. God makes it clear we as the body of Christ are to pray for the peace of Israel. Every day of your life when you're praying your prayers, you should pray for the peace of Israel because God makes it clear we are to pray for Israel. Uh, and what's going on in Israel, in my opinion, here I am getting in trouble again. I'm really at a place where it just doesn't matter anymore. But 
If whether you have to wear a mask or not is more important to you than what's going on in Israel, change your priorities. Because what we need to do as the children of God is to be lifting up God's chosen nation of Israel. And we need to make sure that we focus because what's happening in Salem, Oregon, isn't as important as what's happening on the biblical realm with Israel. Moving on. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which kept the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Some say those sealed will continue to be persecuted on earth and that it will be worldwide. Some say that it won't. I believe it will be worldwide. Uh, one faction even says that the bodies will remain here to be destroyed, but the souls will be sealed in, in heaven. Uh, I can't tell you. All I can tell you is this. We're about to begin to study and see what a real outpouring of wrath is about. And we don't want that. When, when Satan's coming against and God's wrath begins to be poured out, be ready. Be ready, be ready, be ready. And if you don't think you're ready, I would seriously remember this. And I'm going to get into a little bit of preach here for a minute. There is a sorrow that leads to forgiveness. There is a repentance, if I may use that word, that leads to forgiveness from God. And there is a repentance unto damnation. Repentance that is not truly asking Father God to forgive you, not for the benefit of, of, I got caught at this or that, but for the benefit of you have broken the heart of God. True repentance brings salvation. I believe it's in Corinthians it says this. And it, but then it also says that there is repentance, and I think we see a lot of this. People have been taught over the years that say a prayer when you're six, or eight, or ten, or twelve, or fourteen. Whenever you get in trouble, say this prayer. And God's going to cover everything from then on. And he's going to be blind as a bat to the fact that you really don't have a relationship with him. Because you said a few words. I don't want to take that chance. I believe repentance comes straight from the heart. And it brings salvation. It also brings change. Once you've been saved and you repent after that, repentance is literally... Sorry, messed up my page here. It'll be all right. Repentance is what draws you closer to God. Because when you truly repent, I mean, how many repent for, for your thoughts? You know, repent for your thoughts. And God, forgive me for acting this way. Or, or re, forgive me for true repentance. So, closing thoughts, Israel's a key player, always has been, always will be. Watch Israel more than America. You need to know what's going on here, but you need to understand, and I think this chapter makes it clear, that Israel is going to be the key player here. Israel is going to be the key player because, uh, let's face it, it's one of the smallest countries in the world, and it's been under attack for how long? Oh, yeah, 6,000 years. And they still want Israel. Now, what does that mean to us? How does that play out? Well, we got a couple of minutes. It has now been told, and you may know this, you may not, but just off the coast of Israel is the world's largest natural gas deposit in the world. Technically, to get to them, you go through Israel. Everybody wants to destroy Israel because oil will, at some point, if, if God tarries his coming, natural gas will be more valuable than oil. And now they're finding it just off the coast of Israel. And now they're going, oh, wow, so Israel is becoming more valuable than ever. And countries want that. So if it's not playing out as, as a whatever war, there is so many things that are coming that are lining up with a world coming against Israel. 
we have to be cautious not to take our mindset of, oh, what's going on here, and apply it to every prophecy in Scripture. While it does play a part, we are not the key players in the tribulation time. So when, when you get those, again, ruffling feathers here, I have no doubt, but when you get those 16 videos a day about the, the vaccine and the microchip, I look around this room and I would bet you money every person in this room has had a vaccine. I couldn't go to school without them. They weren't, we weren't allowed. We talked about that today. You know what? We had to have a tetanus shot in the South because everything there will kill you, right? We had to have a tetanus shot every five years. You didn't go to school without your vaccines. Well, the microchip is the mark of the beast. Think. Think. You have 66 books of Scripture that says God loves you. You have zero Scripture, zero, that says the moment God gets the chance to sneak the mark of the beast in on you, he's going to jump on it like a baked potato with butter and sour cream. Because he is out to get you. Think. We need to be cautious. Could there be a microchip that becomes part of the mark of the beast? Absolutely. But we do not need to run fear rampant over things that we're seeing take place right now. What we need to do is draw closer to God and let our relationship with him feed us because he is not out to get you. I believe with everything in me, you, know, you will know if you're here during the tribulation, if we all are or not. I believe you will know with everything in you that you are denying Christ when you take that mark. It has to be a decision not to get a peanut butter sandwich. It's a decision that says, I deny Christ and I will choose what I can get on this earth and the peace here and, and, and the world system over him. Otherwise, it wouldn't be free will. And, and, but we get so caught up in this. And, and gosh, I know I'm not popular when I say these things, but why would a God give his life for you, give his son for you, and then look for a way to get you? That's not the God I serve. If he wanted to get me, Kurt, he should have got me a long time ago. And he could have. He's had many opportunities. All he had to do was lift his hand off of me and watch what's going to happen next, right? Because I'm that stupid. I'm that guy that Irma posts about that doesn't believe he's too old to get. Nah. I know it's a thousand pound Harley, but I can jump it off that road right there. Be ready. I'm going to give you a minute here to ask questions, but make sure you're right with God. Make sure you're right with God. And I would even take that a step further. If you don't have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, call somebody that does. Call your elder. Call somebody and say, hey, I don't want to um, announce this out there to everybody, uh, but I've never spoken in tongues. I've never been filled with the Holy Ghost. I've never had the 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 baptism of the holy ghost i've never been empowered by the holy spirit i have the holy spirit because i'm saved but i've never been empowered would you pray with me and make this a matter of prayer because i guarantee you every elder in this church will pray with you that you can receive that because you need the holy spirit to guide you in these last days you need to be guided of what to say what not to say what to do what not to do we got plenty of christians out there doing what they want we that's evident if you're on social media. Smile and wave, boys, they're out there. But the Holy Spirit will tell you, Jim, when to talk and when not to, when to listen. I mean, and make sure your soul's right with God and make sure that you literally are seeking more of God. And if you're not sure about the Holy Spirit and, and maybe you've, you've, I didn't know I was getting into this tonight. Maybe you have never fully received the Holy Spirit and you're like, um, 
I'm just not sure if it's real or not, then challenge God. If there's more of you, I want it. If there's more of you, I want it. I don't know what that means. I don't know how it means it. But if there's more of you, I want it. And if you do that from the bottom of your heart, he will give you every part you need. You're talking to a boy that got baptized in the Holy Ghost in a Baptist church and scared myself and everybody around me to death. Started talking in tongues, trying to say hallelujah. Closed my mouth and made a run for it. Sterling and I ran for an hour. I opened my mouth and tongues came out in a Baptist church. Praise God for the Baptist church. Praise God. Praise God for any church that preaches Jesus and Him crucified. Amen. Amen. Comments or questions? You're more confused than you were when you came? Questions? Did I see a hand? No, I saw Crystal rolling up a blanket. We set it at 70 in here tonight. Is it still too cold? Because I'm sweating. Yeah, I'm sweating. We run it at 68 Sunday, but... All right, since there's no questions, let me give you some highlights. Uh, we are $600 short. Uh, we figured we got backpacks given, 240 backpacks. I have people in Tennessee sending money that uh, friends of mine back there saw our post. This coming Sunday, we will take up an offering. Your regular tithes goes to tithes. That's to fund the church, to keep it open and going. But if you can give above and beyond, we're going to try to raise $600 more by Monday so that we can do 300 backpacks. That's 50 for the high school, 50 for the junior high. Uh, we will not have the big party here that we normally have, but we will give 50 to the junior high, 50 to the high school, and 40 or more, depending on how many we can fill. Uh, Miss Bev has, has worked her tail off to, uh, to get all this together. Uh, it, it's about 20 bucks a backpack or a little more to, to get them filled. Uh, but, but with that said, uh, 600 more bucks, and we'll have like the 2,800 we needed to do the 300 backpacks. So we're close. We're there. So if you can drop something in from a dollar to a hundred on Sunday, praise be to God, we'll fill every dime of it will go towards backpacks. Uh, next week, if you want to help, we're going to be pressure washing sidewalks, uh, painting the rest of the stripes on the side of the parking lot until we can repave it. That'll be our next big move that we're hoping for. Uh, and then we'll be uh, putting some uh, paint on the walkway out here before winter gets here, that gravel paint, that stuff that holds. Uh, we'll be putting some, some orange out there so or some safety yellow, I guess it's called, so that people won't trip over the curbs and things, freshen everything up outside. Uh, lots to do, lots to clean up, so we'll be hollering at you next week if you could come and help do that. But any questions, comments? Miss Irma? It, it, it's, it's complicated because you're trying to simplify it, but there's so much, there's so much, it's just, I'm doing the best I can, but thank you. Father, thank you for these amazing men and women. We love them so much. Thank you for Miss uh, Mary Lee, who could not be here tonight. Lord, she, uh, she is recovering from her procedures, and we thank you, thank you, thank you for the good report. I thank you for Miss Irma's good report. We prayed this morning and expected, Father, that you would touch and give her a good report from her cataract being removed and the pressure in her eye. You did what we asked. You did what you always do. You are God, and we thank you for healing that. Lord, we believe in that her eyesight will become sharper and clearer as the days go on. Father, I thank you that you're still in the healing business. I thank you that you're still filling people with your Holy Ghost. I thank you for the men and women that are not here yet, but that are coming in Jesus' name. We give you honor and praise. And all God's people said, thanks for being with us on Facebook. God bless you. Have a great night.